everybody, welcome back to Rain and Pause. I'm Mitch and today I'm giving you 10 top tips for the Shelly Art Bloom Technique. Now this is not a tutorial, this is not a guide on how to do blooms. This is my 10 tips that I see most commonly asked in the Shelly Art Bloom group and in other fluid art groups. And hopefully these tips will help you to figure out what um, is causing a specific problem and how to fix it. So tip number one, and the most important tip when it comes to this technique is consistency is key. If you haven't seen the video on my channel already, I show you the exact consistency that works the best for me, for my pillow and my pouring medium. Now this consistency will work globally. So I like my pillow paint at a five to six second trace. That means that when I drizzle the paint into the container, it's going to leave a mark in the paint on the bottom for about five to six seconds before completely disappearing. For my pouring medium, I like that to be at about two to three seconds. So it needs to be slightly thinner than your pillow paint, and that's gotta be thicker than your cell activator. Having that ratio of divide between each consistency is the most important thing when doing your blooms. Honestly, 99% of the problems with the bloom technique can be solved by adjusting your consistency in one way or another. Learning how to adjust that consistency, either making your paints thicker or thinner, is another important step and another important lesson that you should learn. Again, I address that in my consistency is key video, which I will link in the card above. And you can find that on my channel as well. Tip number two is to use the correct ingredients. If you are doing this technique, you need to have the right ingredients. Uh, contrary to what some people will say that haven't done the course and believe they're doing a bloom, the right ingredients are crucial. You can't do this technique with just any varnish, any paint, any this, any that. I see all the time people saying, I'm using the exact same ingredients as Shelly is, but they're not. Titanium white paint, only certain titanium white paints will work. Amsterdam and Atelier are the two best titanium white paints, but Montmartre won't work. I've tried Matisse, Matisse is a high quality brand, and the titanium white just does not work for a cell activator. So usually what we find is if they don't work as a cell activator, they'll work well in the pouring medium and vice versa. So getting the right ingredients, getting the right clear drying paint base. In the US, it's the Bare 8300. That's the absolute top of the line, best paint you can buy for this technique because it dries perfectly clear. It's thick, it's hard to work with unless you know what to do with it. In other words, you need to thin that out to a point where it's workable but it will dry perfectly clear. So if you're mixing paints or pigments, they are gonna be 100% accurate to what's in the tube. Here in Australia, we use the Taubman's Neutral, and that is the best paint for us. Uh, in the Shelly Art Bloom course, you get access to a handbook and all of the paints recommended for the different areas around the world that we know of, they are recommended in there. So if you are interested in learning this technique and doing this technique, you can take that course at shellyart.com.au to get access to that handbook. Tip number three is that the Aussie flow troll is key. There are so many people in the world at the moment uh, saying that I've got a recipe for cell activator that doesn't use Australian flow troll and it looks exactly like Australian flow troll. But the fact is no matter how much you try, it's never going to look like Australian flow troll. Uh, you can get close, but you can never replicate it exactly. And it bores me to death that people say, I found the missing ingredient that's in Australian flow troll and that's not in U US flow troll. You're never gonna know unless you work for flood flow troll and you know the difference in the chemical formulations between Australia and Europe and America until you become that person and you become the chief chemical engineer that knows exactly what that ingredient is and what the difference is between all, all of the different iterations of it around the world. You cannot possibly say that you know what that key ingredient is but the fact remains that it is crucial to this technique. People have been finding success with using US flow troll watered down 10 to one with um, their paint. So using 10 parts US flow troll to one part of their chosen uh, cell activator color. However, the result is not exactly the same. There's just something about the Australian flow troll that gives the cells a really nice shape, a really nice consistency, and it just helps them to hold up. Whereas the US flow troll, yeah, you can get similar to that, but it always, you can always tell on the edges of the lacing, it sort of breaks up a little bit. And that's just because you're not using that missing ingredient that's in the Australian flow troll. So tip number three being Australian flow troll is key. If you are looking for Australian flow troll, Fluid Art Co sells it worldwide. So fluid-art.co, you can get that in Europe, USA, Canada, the UK, and in Australia, we can get it from Budding. So you won't find that on their website here. <music> 
Tip number four is to not whip your paints. Whipping your paints is the first way that you can introduce bubbles into your paint. And with this technique, you will see them in your final result. Because the paint is a little bit thicker than normal techniques, often it is the thickest pouring technique that you could get away with, uh, you will see those bubbles as they come to the surface. So a couple of ways that you can reduce bubbles in your paint is to mix a day or two beforehand. Your paints will thicken up over that time, but you can give them a gentle stir. And by mixing them a day or two in advance, all the bubbles will come to the surface. Tip, uh, the second thing you could do is use the brand new Fluid Art Co paint mixers. I was skeptical about this because I'm just using an Ikea one at the, I was using an Ikea one before a couple of days ago. And I got sent this in the mail and there is a key difference between using this and the Ikea one. The Ikea one does not spin. It just wobbles side to side and vibrates side to side. This one spins. And as it spins, it's whipping your paints in a circle rather than frothing it. So I actually want one of these for my coffee because it, it just works so well. I was absolutely surprised. I mixed up paints yesterday for a pour and it does not introduce any bubbles at all as long as you keep it under the surface of the paint. So using a paint mixer like that underneath the, the level of the paint is a great way to mix it without introducing bubbles. And the third thing I would say is don't whip your paints. Mix them gently, scrape the sides, scrape the bottom, and just fold your paints in. If you whip them and you introduce too much air, you're gonna be left with those bubbles and you'll never get rid of them. Tip number five is about temperature. Ambient temperature in your working area is crucial to drying your blooms. If your temperature is too cold, you're going to end up with warped cells and your paint's not drying quick enough. So your cells can disintegrate, your paints won't dry, and they're just gonna look terrible. If you're working in an area where it is too hot, your paints will dry too quickly and you can face issues like cracking and crazing. And yeah, again, you're, not, you're just not gonna get the result that you're after. So paints dry best between 20 and 30 degrees Celsius, which is about 68 to 86 degrees Fahrenheit. So if you can regulate the temperature of the room that you're in, that's really gonna help your blooms dry the best that they can. Turn on an air conditioner, either on heat or on cold, and just keep that running while you're painting and for a couple of hours after you've done your painting. Once that initial film sets on the top of your paint, you should be good to turn that air condition off. But if it's going to be, you know, negative four degrees Celsius overnight, leave that air condition running all night. Yeah, it's an extra added cost and it does rack up some power bills, but for the sake of your art drying properly, it's better to spend a couple of dollars on electricity than it is to spend on a whole can of paint on a commission artwork that you ruined because it was too hot and it dried too quickly and cracked. Also, the temperature that you work in will affect the working time and drying time of your paints and also with resin. So if you're operating with resin, uh, you fall into that category again, 20 to 30 degrees or 68 to 86 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, if it's too cold, your resin won't set, same as your paints, and if it's too hot, they'll set too quickly. So it also affects your working time. Uh, if it is too warm, you'll have less time to work with your paints than uh, if it was too cold, for example. That will also affect the consistency of your paints. So if it's too hot, you'll find that your paints are often really thin and runny. And if it's too cold, you'll often find that your paints are really thick and gloopy. That can change in a matter of hours. So I have mixed up paints perfectly, used them one day, come back the next day, it's been slightly colder overnight and all of my paints are thick, gloopy messes. So you'll have to adjust your consistencies based on temperature of the day and the time of day really too. So if you paint in the mornings, it's gonna be a lot cooler, your paints will be thicker. If you wait until the heat of the day, your paints will naturally thin out a little bit. Tip number six is not all brands of paint will work. So I address this in tip number one or tip number two. Um, not all brands will work as a cell activator and not all brands will work as a pouring medium. So for the longest time, Shelley was under the impression that Atelier Interactive did not work in the pouring medium just because of how thick and gloopy it made them when you mix them up. However, after a bit of experimenting on my behalf, I found and showed her that, yeah, you can use them in your pouring medium, but it takes a lot more work and they will thicken up a lot quicker than other paints will over time. So for example, if I'm using a Matisse paint and I'm using the same color in an Atelier Interactive paint, they'll both work well in the pouring medium, but the Atelier will thicken up twice or three times as much as the Matisse paint will in the same time of working with them. So you'll constantly have to adjust the consistency of your Atelier paint compared to the Matisse. Also in saying that, most Atelier paints will work really well for a cell activator, but some Matisse paints work great in the pouring medium and not in the cell activator. It really is a hit and miss. 
and it's just how those individual paints are formulated, what's in their binders, what's in their pigments, and how they interact with that Australian flow troll to give you those really nice cells. So if you want to find out if a colour will work as a cell activator, the only way to do it is to try it. Tip number seven is to use quality paints. Don't cheap out on your tube paints and don't cheap out on your house paint. So we recommend certain paints and ingredients for a reason and it's because the quality matters when you're doing blooms. If you use cheaper paints, they often have less binders, less lower quality binders, lower quality pigments and less pigment physically present. So what you'll notice is if you use those cheaper paints in this technique, as soon as you blow those out and you start to spread them over your pillow, they're gonna break apart. And that's just because the binders are not strong enough to keep the pigment bound in that solution. And there's not enough pigment physically present that you can stretch them to give that really nice thin layer. So what you have to imagine is, for example, a bed sheet. Imagine your paints like a bed sheet and when they're in the tube, they're scrunched up into a really nice tight ball and it looks really nice and dense and compact. But as soon as you blow on them and you use them in a bloom and you spread them out, that sheet becomes really, really thin. So while in a ball, everything might look opaque and it looks, you know, you can't see through it. As soon as you spread that out, that sheet goes transparent. You can almost see straight through that bed sheet, or at least you can see some light coming through. The same goes for pigments and, and paints for, for that matter. So if you stretch them too far, you're eventually going to put a hole in that paint. And that will display as either flocculation or crazing, depending on if you're using a paint or a pigment. So using a higher quality paint is going to mean that you're going to have more pigments suspended in that solution, higher quality binders, more expensive ingredients to make that paint a higher quality, and you're going to see that in your final result, especially with the bloom technique. Tip number eight is about adding too much gloss varnish. If you add too much gloss varnish to thin down your pouring medium, it can cause your, your cell activator to do all sorts of crazy things. Most often it'll cause uh, warped cells, so your cell activator will look fine when you blow it out, but come back an hour later and everything's gone warped and squiggly. That can be caused by a couple of things, uh, like uh, your paints being too thin underneath and your cell activator being too thin, but most often that will be because you've got too much gloss in your pouring medium. So if you do need to thin out your paints and you think you're bordering on that point of adding too much gloss, just add water to it. By that point, you've added enough gloss medium and you've added enough uh, paint and varnish to it that you've got plenty of binders in there and you can dilute it with a little bit of water. And that's gonna be the quickest way to bring it down to a working consistency for you. Tip number nine, and this is something that we recommend in the Bloom Group all the time, is start with tube paints before you move on to pigments. I know I absolutely adore the This Little Piggy pigments, but we hate to see them wasted. What we see constantly is people using the piggies and saying, oh, they faded, they did this, they did that, they're not working for me. The reason is, and that's specific to blooms, the reason is because you don't understand the concept of how a bloom is meant to work first. And oftentimes we will see that the person using those pigments, and it could be from any brand, not just TLP, uh, the reason we see that is because they don't actually know how to bloom just yet. So what we say is use tube paints. In this instance, we say use a cheaper brand of tube paint, so you can understand how consistency works and how the cell activator interacts with it. And then when you're ready, move up to the expensive brands. But you always want to use tube paints in your pores with pigments because they do behave a little bit differently. We often recommend to use a tube paint as your first and last layer in the pore for a couple of reasons. For the base layer, that will prevent or hide flocculation. It's not going to prevent it because some pigments just are naturally bigger in particle size. So you're gonna see that if you're using it over a light base. So using a similar colored tube paint underneath is just going to mask the gaps in between each particle so it doesn't look like they're breaking apart. So for example, if I'm using this little piggy Grenache, which is a really nice red color, I will find a similar colored red or just another colored paint to go underneath this as my first layer on the pore. And that's going to mask if this paint, uh, if this pigment, for example, breaks up and I start to see flocculation, I'm not gonna notice it because there's a paint underneath masking that. And the paint is often gonna have their pigments ground super, super, super fine. Like you're never going to see the grains of pigment in a paint compared to a pigment powder. And that's any pigment powder, again, not just TLPs. So by having that underneath, you're going to mask the gaps in between the pigments. By having the tube paint as the last layer under the cell activator, it's going to help that cell activator stay afloat as it can tend to sink, I guess, 
through the pigments. So the way I would imagine it is you've got a sandcastle and a piece of string. Your cell activator is the piece of string and if you just pull that down through the sandcastle, it's going to cut through it. So the pigments and the particles of sand are just going to move apart and allow that cell activator to fall through. So what you'll find is if you put your, your pigments as the last layer before your cell activator, your cell activator will give you really thin, fine lacing and no uh, cells. So using that paint, last layer will help to float that and you'll get a lot more cells in there. What we recommend is to do tube paint, two pigments, tube paint, two pigments, tube paint, two pigments, so on and so forth. You can use as many as you like, as long as you're using a tube paint in between somewhere. Um, and that's just going to help, one, prevent flocculation, two, hold up the pigment, and three, make them more visible and uh, prevent that cell activator from doing those weird things that it does uh, with pigment. Tip number 10 is to put enough colour in your puddles. Oftentimes we'll see people saying that their colours didn't spread well or it's not reaching the edge of the canvas and the sole reason for that is you're just not putting enough colour in the middle. For a uh, four inch tile, I actually have a video on this called Paint Volumes, which I'll remember to link. And for a four inch tile, I try to cover two thirds of the painting with my pillow paint and the other two thirds with my colours. So that way when you blow them out, they're going to spread all the way to the edge. Now, depending on the effect you want, you might not want that, but as a general rule, if you want full cover cover, if you want full cover, if you want full color coverage, uh, you'll need to put down a fair amount of uh, paint onto your canvas so that it will spread all the way. And here's a bonus tip for you all. Tip number 11 is ignore the rules. So. Often we recommend to use a tube paint before a pigment or do this or do that. At the end of the day, it's just painting. You can do whatever the hell you want to do with your painting. It's art, it's your art, it's your expression. Everyone has the right to experiment. Everyone has the right to play around. The reason we make these recommendations, especially for beginners, is because they are the easiest way to get into the bloom technique. And that would go for any pouring technique. A lot of people will say if you're doing a flip cup or a straight pour, don't add silicon right away because the silicon adds another level of complexity to the technique. So using paint and water is the best way to start with a Dutch pour, but then you can start modifying your mix by adding in glue or a flow troll or this or that to give your paints a different technique. So understanding why those ingredients are there and understanding why you start with the basics and move on to the more complicated stuff is like learning to crawl before you can walk. So you need to take baby steps. We recommend those baby steps to everyone that's starting out. And then as you progress and you can understand why this component acts like that and why you need to use this over this, why you need to layer it that way. Once you understand that, go ahead and do what you want. It's entirely up to you. And we're there to help answer questions. And that's what this channel is all about. It's helping to answer questions and show what you can do with this technique. But again, those rules are there. And the, the guidelines are there or the recommendations are there to help newbies out. If you're a professional, if you feel like you're at that level where you can take on that painting and you know change absolutely everything about the recipe, go ahead and do it. But just know that if you ever need to come back to basics, that's where you're gonna start. So there you go, that's my top 10 tips on the Shelly Art Bloom technique. Hopefully they help you to understand the technique a little bit better and why we use certain things um, over others. And if you're liking what I'm doing here, don't forget to like and subscribe and I'll see you next time. Bye.